I was a jail nurse for about three years in a correctional facility that housed approximately 1,300 inmates. Loved the job. Would have stayed longer, but administration sucked. But that's another story. I work night shift and have had some creepy stuff happen that just could be rationally explained. I worked both booking and infirmary, but the majority of the incidents occurred in infirmary. Okay, so I was there maybe a month. Not a new nurse, but new to corrections. Anyone who has spent any time in a jail will tell you that when those heavy doors slam shut, it is a very distinctive, definitive loud sound. So to get into the infirmary, you have to have a key or be buzzed in by central control. So I'm sitting at my desk and I hear the metal door outside my office click, like someone from central has unlocked it, and it opens about halfway and then just slams shut. Now in my office, there is a huge glass window, so the nursing staff can see any inmates that are about to enter. So when the door slammed, I thought it was just the officers messing around, and I jumped up and went to the window, and no one was there. I called Central, and the officer that answered sounded like I just woke him from a sound sleep. I said, ha ha, very funny. He had no idea what I was talking about. And I knew this officer and I was surprised that he would go along with any type of prank because, frankly, he was kind of a jerk with absolutely no sense of humor. So I just thought it was some mechanical glitch. I sat down and everything just, like, changed. It felt colder and I felt like I was being watched. I was just all around uncomfortable. I took my stethoscope from around my neck and put it on the desk and left my office to go into the medical department. I stayed in medical for a few, talking to the staff in there, and then went back to my office. When I walked in, I went to grab my stethoscope off the desk to check an inmate, and it wasn't there. I looked on the desk, on the side, underneath. It just wasn't there. I should mention that when I left my office, I did lock the door as per protocol, and I'm the only one on shift with the key. Now, I think I'm going crazy, so I start looking everywhere, and I cannot find it. Now in my office there is a large closet that holds all supplies, this is also locked, with the key being on the set of keys that I carry. Later in the shift I needed to go into the closet and get something, I really don't remember what and sitting in the middle of the floor is my stethoscope. I picked it up and the heavy metal door outside my office clicks again, opens halfway and slams shut. I locked the closet, locked my office and went out for a smoke. I was scared, but I had responsibilities and patients to look after, so I go back in. And I swear, the whole atmosphere felt lighter. It was warmer, and I just felt more comfortable. After my shift, the central officers rewound the tapes for me, and I saw the doors just open and slam shut, with not a single person near them or in the hallway. I wish I could say that was the last time that happened or that I got comfortable with it, I didn't, because each time it happened, it seemed that the door slammed harder, and that uncomfortable feeling lasted longer and longer, and it felt almost like being stalked. Things that went missing were found in different parts in the jail. My pen case and the woman's wing, my med sheets and solitary central control room, my portable blood pressure cuff in the kitchen, and each and every time something of mine would show up in some other part of the jail, the officers and I would look at the tapes and see no one. Remember I said I felt like I was being stalked? Well, that's because all these things happened to me, but no other nurse who worked nights. Not one other nurse who worked on my days off had any doors click or open or slam shut. Their stuff didn't disappear and then reappear somewhere else. It was just me. Every officer and every one of the medical staff who worked there well before I got there swore up and down this type of incident never ever occurred before. It got to the point for me that I just started staying in my office. I just got all my stuff that I needed for my shift and sat at the officer's desk. I did that until I left there and got another job. I haven't had anything like that happen again. In sixth grade, I'm a senior now, I had a friend. To preserve her own anonymity, I'll call her Jenny. I grew up outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, near New Cumberland in a borough called Lemoyne. 
The streets are very close together and everyone lives near one another and Jenny was no exception. I would walk over to her house and watch television or anime with her, as kids do. I don't remember exactly how the topic of her ghost came up, but we were all very invested in the paranormal. Jenny, me, and our whole slew of friends. Now, if you've ever been to Lemoyne, you would know that most of the houses are old and were added on, refurbished, remodeled, expanded, and most of these old houses are now townhouses. I think this is why Jenny had two closets. One closet was always closed for the most part. It was deep and it was always dark. The closet Jenny actually used to hold her clothes was on the opposite end of the room. This is why she never used the first closet. Jenny's room was always very cold, unnaturally so. The room would open and close often, and it just generally didn't feel right. Jenny had shelves across the length of her room, and on those shelves were the creepiest porcelain dolls, still in their boxes, heirlooms from one of her relatives, I think. I never asked for specifics. The dolls would move in their boxes. They would turn one way or the other, always when we weren't looking, repositioned enough for us to note a definitive change in their pose. It was spooky. Jenny called her ghost Mandy and said she was a little girl. Jenny also had a young sister, probably three or four at the time, and Mandy hated her. She would be scratched frequently. If her sister was in the room with us, we would be scratched too. We wouldn't notice them until later as they didn't hurt, but I think they hurt her sister. They were on our arms for the most part, looked like someone clawed us, and looked like they were scabbed over in the way it cuts to after a couple of hours, always three of them. I think Jenny's sister got them on her back and they were a lot less superficial. It got so bad Jenny's mom forbade Jenny's sister from going in her room. I had a phone back in 2012, one of those phones with a full keyboard that you turn on its side and slide up. I took a picture of Jenny's open closet once and unfortunately I no longer have the picture as the phone is probably in a landfill, but it clearly showed a girl's face partially hidden by the clothes Jenny had hanging mostly fancy stuff in her dad's old suits. Eyes, nose, lips, hair, the whole nine yards, just her face peeking out, almost shyly. There wasn't any real malice in her gaze, not that I remember. She was just there. Well, Jenny's ghost became common knowledge among our friend group, so we decided to have a sort of junior seance, so to speak. I think there were seven other people that came over for this. It was a whole planned out event, but... We knew better than to bring a Ouija board. Seven people plus Jenny and I, so nine total. We agreed to go into the closet in shifts. Six would go in at once, then four would exit and the others would enter, since there wasn't a whole lot of room. It was big, but not big enough to hold nine, eleven, to twelve-year-olds at once. And a couple of our friends fancied themselves psychics. It was all very juvenile, and we were excited. I was one of the three who wasn't inside the closet at the time. Convenient, I know. The other two and I were pressing our ears to the door and hear what they were saying when all of a sudden we hear screaming and beating down the door, bowling us over, scrambling out of there. Apparently one of the girls who believed she could talk to the ghost placed her iPhone 3 or 4 or whatever she had on a little shelf in the closet and said, if you're here with us, move this phone, or something to that effect. According to another friend who was in the closet, she had repeated a couple of times. It was all very muffled, the door was really thick, and we couldn't really make out what they were saying, which is why we didn't hear what happened until they started screaming. Before the psychic friend could finish asking again, the phone apparently chucked itself across the closet and smashed into the wall, like someone had thrown it. That's when they came out. Needless to say, we were all well and spooked and decided to call it a night. We never spoke about Mandy again. My friend Jenny's ghost is something I still struggle to explain to this day. This happened on Tuesday. I keep going back to it, trying to find an explanation, so I thought I'd share it here. To set the scene, I work in an office on a floor with other offices that all share the same set of two bathrooms, one for men and one for women and a hallway that connects all the offices. You have to type in a code to get into the bathroom, I guess to prevent people from other floors or outsiders using your bathroom. 
Each bathroom has three stalls and hand-washing stations plus air hand dryers. The ladies' bathroom receives enough traffic from the different offices that it's rare to be alone in there. For this reason, I rarely poop at work. On this particular day, I had an urgent need, so I fast-walked to the bathroom, hoping that by some miracle the bathroom would be empty. On my way there, these two ladies, presumably from other offices, were walking down the same hallway to the bathroom, talking to each other loudly. Their loudness was irritating me, and what was even more irritating was they sped up to walk at a pace to follow me into the bathroom so that they wouldn't have to punch in the code. I was annoyed, but I couldn't very well slam the bathroom door in their face, so I let them in, and we each proceeded into the three stalls. I remember the thud, thud, thud of all three of our bathroom doors closing and the click of the locking. They stopped talking after going into the stalls and I proceeded to focus on my business. At some point I realized the bathroom was too quiet. The usual noises you hear from fellow bathroom stallmates, such as grunting or sighing or just the shuffling of clothes was not at all audible. I was weirded out but figured maybe they were just staying really, really still and quiet for some personal reason. I finished up and left the stall to discover that both of their stalls were empty. The doors were open and no one was there. The stall doors squeaked a bit more when you opened them and I hadn't heard that. No one was at the sink and I hadn't heard either of them wash or dry their hands. There was only one entrance slash exit door to the bathroom and it makes a noise as well so I would have heard it if they had left. There is no way to leave that bathroom without making some sort of noise so... It was like they had just teleported out of the stalls. I washed and dried my hands and exited the bathroom, contemplating how they could have just disappeared. When I saw them, they were walking down the hallway towards the bathroom, walking and talking exactly as they had been when I had been heading into the bathroom. I ended up holding the door open for them again, except this time it was for them to go in after me and not go in with me. It's so mundane and it's the first time anything like this has happened to me. I don't know them at all and I don't remember their conversation. It was some boring personal stuff. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and theories. I work on a top floor of a building, sixth floor. The building I work at is a government organization with all ministries of the government and over 4,000 offices. I've worked there for a couple of months now and I know the place pretty well. It was on a Monday, the 10th of December 2018, around past 11 a.m., when something strange happened. I'm posting this to find out if it has ever happened to someone else because I'm really confused and almost nobody believes me or takes it with the level of seriousness I think this deserves. I'm in my office going through my daily work routines when I get a knock at the door. I habitually respond with a come in as I usually do. The client comes in and I process a few papers for him when I notice I didn't have the stamp needed to authenticate the documents in my office. I tell the client to give me a minute to go downstairs to get the stamp. I leave him waiting for me in the office. The elevators are at the end of the hallway to the left of my office, ten seconds away. I take the elevator downstairs and without wasting any time, I greet the lady in the office I was going to get the stamps from, just around the corner from the elevators, and I tell her the agenda of my being there. She directs me to take it from the countertop, of which I do, and right away leave and go back to the elevators. I get in and I press the button for the sixth floor as I always do. At this time, I say it's been about two minutes since I'd left my office. As it goes up, I'm alone in it. I look at the display counting floors going up as I reluctantly do all the time. Then, when the elevator reaches the fourth floor, power cuts off. Although it's become pitch black in the elevator, I eventually locate the control panel and I press the emergency button and right away a voice comes on the PA system asking me which floor I'm on. I tell the guy the fourth floor and in about a minute he shows up. While he is manually opening the doors, power comes back up and I open the doors and he asked me which floor I was going to. I told him the 6th. He told me I could use the elevator to proceed to the 6th as electricity was back. I press 6 again and the elevator closes and it starts rising again. Looking at the LCD as usual, the elevator passes through 5 and reaches the 6th floor. The doors open normally and I proceed to go on to my office. 
As I was leaving the elevator, I feel it has suddenly become a bit colder than it was before, blazing heat in the summer this side. I could say it had almost become cold, but I didn't make a big deal out of it. When I reach my office door, same number on the door, I open the door and get in only to find that the guy who was waiting for me, not there, but a lady I've never seen before sitting behind my desk on my computer punching away keys. Now very confused, I just briefly pause and look at her. She looks at me with surprise and also asks if she can help me the same way you'd ask someone just walking into your office and just looking at you without saying nothing. I asked her if this was Office 6162, my office number, and she said it was. Now extremely puzzled, I look around to scan the office and I notice it has exactly the same furniture as mine and the same setup as mine. Not knowing what to say or do, I tell her, I'm sorry, I'll be back soon, I forgot something. I step out into the hallway and I look at the door to find it really is my office and I am on the right floor. I just decided to go back to the elevator, not sure why, and I get in and press 6 again. At this time, I'd say it's been about 5 minutes or so since I left my office. The elevator closes for a brief second and opens up again without going anywhere. Only this time, the guy who works at reception I'd passed on my way down just outside the elevators was now sitting there, sitting down as he was the first time I went downstairs. I get out and take the same route to my office, now deciding I'd just confront the lady. When I open the door to my office, I find the guy who had been waiting for me to get the stamp sitting where I'd left him, alone with no one behind my desk. Before I even say anything, he says to me, I thought you were no longer coming back or you decided to go for lunch. I say to him, why would you think that when I just stepped away for like five minutes to get the stamp? Then he says, man, you've been gone for more than 45 minutes. You left before 12, it's like, oh geez, it's 12.35. I completely freaked out. I stamp the papers for him and he leaves. When I sit in front of my computer, I realized I had actually been gone for more than an hour. I was 100% sober that day. I had only had a cigarette on my way to work that day. Still sitting there, blank-faced, I quickly note how hot it's become again, as it was that day. I start recollecting my thoughts and try to see what happened. The first thing I note is I'd never seen the guy who came to rescue me from the elevator before, even though I know most of the workers just by seeing them. I brushed it off because it's a slim chance I know all of them since this was a big place, but I'm sure I've seen everyone who works in my wing. It was a bit out of place. I know you're wondering why I didn't check the neighboring offices. Well, there's an explanation. That day, I was the only one in my department around. Others were at a workshop and others were on a field day. The only person who was there was one of the bosses that I generally don't talk to. Another thing I remember once I was thinking about is I don't remember seeing anyone at the reception area when I got lost. I also remember that the woman was wearing a heavy cardigan, one that you wouldn't wear in the blazing summer at this time. Other than that, everything was in place. If there's anyone who can try to explain to me what happened or if it once happened to someone, please let me know. And don't tell me I was high or something like everyone else. I'm from Zimbabwe, in case you were wondering. I work as a dietary aide at an assisted living facility. When most people hear that phrase, they think of a nursing home, cold, clinical, and filled with delusional screaming, but the reality is actually a lot different. The facility in which I work feels more like a lavish hotel, almost like a big, cozy house. Assisted living is often seen as the first step towards complete dependence, with complete dependence being a nursing home, as most of our residents can function entirely on their own but may need a bit of help with mobility, memory, or simply don't have the ability to take care of their own homes anymore. Thus, we have a wide variety of residents, some of whom are only in their 60s and are nearly independent, up to residents reaching 100 who need to have nearly constant assistance. One of our residents, we'll call her Barb, was one of the former. She was one of the younger ones, able to administer her own medication, get herself up in the morning and remember mealtimes, and just generally able to think straight and care for herself. 
I've had my job for about a year now and started when I was 17. Barb and I have always had a pretty close relationship, with her always asking about my grades and my home life and always showing me pictures of her grandkids and whatnot. She had a very teasing, snarky, and sarcastic attitude about her, one that I found humorous and enjoyable, especially whenever I returned the favor with my own sarcasm. Overall, we were always pretty close. Naturally, when you work in a facility in which multiple people in the past have died, you expect some hauntings. I'm certainly not a psychic or anything, but I am often able to tell when a place is haunted just by a strange feeling that I get. The first time I recall this happening was after the death of my friend's mother. Her house had a completely different feel, and I was unable to sleep there anymore. She thought I was stupid until she woke up one morning to see her mother standing in the doorway. As I said, I'm not a psychic, but I am a bit sensitive to the paranormal. The first time I entered the facility, even in all of its warmth and energy, I got that sort of off feeling. Co-workers warn me that it's not rare to hear voices in the kitchen and to see pots and pans go flying, which would eventually become almost a weekly event for me to witness. Some people were scared to be alone in the kitchen, but I honestly never felt that. Even knowing that the place was haunted, I simply didn't feel as though I was in any danger. If anything, I felt less alone, as though I were in the presence of residents I hadn't had the chance to meet. A few days ago, I was doing dishes in the kitchen before dinner. My fellow aides had not come in yet and the cook was on break. I noticed that there was a lot more strange activity than usual. Whispering from the back mop room, hanging pans swaying in the non-existent breeze, and movement just out of the corner of my eye. I ignored it, as this was still something that I was accustomed to. The only thing that I had found odd was that Barb had approached the kitchen door and was staring in at me, as though she wanted something. Usually around this time of day, she would let me know that the coffee on the coffee bar had gone cold and that it was time for me to replace it. She was very picky about the temperature of her drinks. I nodded, running back to start a new pot, and opened the door to let her know that it would be ready momentarily. But she was gone. I looked down the hall into the dining room and into the living room, but she was nowhere to be seen. I found this odd since this was usually the time she would settle into the dining room, but I didn't pay it much thought. I went back to doing dishes and eventually felt a hand on my shoulder. Thinking it was the cook, who was one of my good friends who would often sneak up on me, I looked down and realized the hand was not his. It was dainty and wrinkled, olive-colored like Barb's. I turned around, and no one was there. This was definitely weird. Barb knew that the kitchen was off-limits to residents and she wasn't one to play tricks, despite being funny and sarcastic. How could she disappear that fast? I assumed it was one of two things, either my imagination or perhaps just a paranormal aspect I hadn't yet witnessed. After all, it wasn't that far-fetched given that I had already been hearing and seeing things today. The day went on as usual. We served dinner, got the kitchen and dining room cleaned up and prepared to leave. I did find it a bit strange that Barb wasn't there for dinner, however, usually she never skipped. Maybe one of her family members had taken her out to eat or something. As my fellow dietary aides and I were heading to the elevator, we passed by a group of residents in the sitting area who told us goodbye as they did every night, but one of the residents stopped us and asked if we heard the news. None of us had, apparently, and he went on to explain. Barb died that morning. Naturally, we were all shocked. What happened? She was young and seemingly healthy. News of deaths usually made it to dietary staff last due to patient confidentiality and whatnot, but to have gone the whole day not knowing. We were used to death, but it didn't make it all that much easier. As I was clocking out, however, it hit me. Hadn't I seen Barb earlier that day? In the afternoon? I was venting to my mom about the death and how it affected me personally. I also told her about what I had witnessed today since she's a believer in the paranormal as I am. I told her how much it hurt me, especially since the last thing I had told her was see you tomorrow, the previous night, and she died before I could see her. What my mom replied with, though, made me feel immensely better. Maybe that's why she visited you. Maybe she wanted to see you one last time before she passed on. As much as I miss Barb, I'm truly grateful that I got to see her one last time, 
even after she had passed. It makes me feel good knowing that she may have been thinking of me and what I said to her the night before. Just to give you a mental idea of the house, it was a very old house way out in the country that had an even older abandoned house right behind it, with no more than a foot and a half separating the two. We were pretty much surrounded by fields and underground caves. To start things off, I'll let everyone know that I had my own room in the house, but I only ever slept in the room maybe a total of five times the entire time we lived there. The last time I ever tried to sleep in there, something happened that made me refuse to sleep in there ever again. I had been laying there for just a few minutes, tossing and turning about, going through the usual difficulties of falling asleep. Dad was in the living room just a few feet away watching TV. I roll over to my side to find that the pillow next to me has an indentation on it. Now, plenty of things have already happened in the house to let me know that it was haunted, so I didn't just brush it off like some might. I was already freaked out, but nothing too major. I flipped the pillow and fluffed it back up, hoping that was the end of it. It wasn't. I feel something brush against my arm. The arm that is closest to the pillow. My eyes burst wide open, and I see the pillow has an indentation again. As I lay there frozen, my entire bed started to shake. Not violently, but enough that I could feel it. I bolted into the living room, and the first thing my dad said to me was, What just happened? He could tell by how white my face was and how wide my eyes were that I had been freaked out. After that, I started sleeping on one of the two couches in the living room. We would always hear the screams of little girls in the fields behind the house at night, but never could find anything upon investigation. Dad asked the person that he was renting from about it and was told that everyone reports that, as well as a lot of the other strange activity. One morning my dad woke up with a pack of his cigarettes with all of the cigarettes except for one in the middle flipped upside down. It was a brand new pack, minus the one that he had before to go to bed the night before. He swears up and down that he knows that it wasn't like that before. Every single night there would be footsteps pacing back and forth down the long kitchen, which was right behind the living room. The sounds of high heels at first, then it would switch to heavy boots. This would usually go on from about 12 to 2.30 or 3 in the morning. I watched a lot of late night infomercials on the TV because of that preventing me from falling asleep. If you didn't wear socks to bed, you would wake up to someone tickling your bare feet. The computer chair, also in the living room, would sometimes lean back on its own, ever so slightly, then rotate a little bit as well. Not a lot, but enough to notice. One night, when I was just about to fall asleep, my remote control gravedigger monster truck that was in the living room moved about three feet on its own. My dad heard it as well, since his bedroom door was open and there were no other walls between the living room and his. It was a small house. I laughed and told him that was a good one. He told me that he didn't do it. I didn't believe him at first, but then realized that the remote control for it was in the living room with me, sitting on the other side of the room. Then he also pointed out that the battery wasn't even in the truck and that it was charging in the kitchen. That one freaked me out too. We also went to investigate the abandoned house behind ours, and it legitimately looked like someone just decided to leave and not take anything with them. We did film it, but before I get your hopes up, the recordings have unfortunately been lost and are long gone as this was several years ago. We managed to catch several orbs, what appeared to be a face in one of the mirrors, and a rocking horse starting to rock on its own just as we were leaving the room it was in. I was posting in another subreddit about a scary experience with a human I had while walking home late from a job after getting off the last bus to my part of town, and it reminded me of this experience, which still gives me chills and I have never been able to make any sense of it. Before this, I have not had any paranormal experiences, and I have never had any after this. I've always believed that a person's spirit can exist in a limited space between life and death, but I never believed in demons or anything of that nature. This happened maybe six or seven years ago when I was working swing shifts, meaning I'd get off at work at 12am and usually wouldn't be home until at least 1. 
I didn't drive yet, so I was taking the bus and had to walk about a mile home every night. But I was used to it and had lived in the neighborhood for two decades, so rarely felt unsettled walking around late at night. My house sits directly on the southeast corner of an intersection at a four-way stop. I was standing on the northwest corner, waiting for the light to change so I could finally get home, make some dinner, wind down and watch Netflix till I went to sleep around 3 or 4 a.m. Since I was working swings regularly, I was very awake and used to keeping odd hours, so I'm certain that my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. The lights I was standing at often takes a long time to change and people sometimes come flying down the hill, so I waited patiently. My iPod was dead and so I was just looking around, waiting to cross. I glanced down the street to the east up the intersection, up a winding road that went into the main part of town. There was a big bank of blackberry bushes growing between my house and my neighbor's house, and I noticed them moving slightly. We have a lot of raccoons in the area, so I didn't think much of it. Right before this light changed, something shot out of the bushes. It was shaped like a human, but it was on all fours. Rear end in the air, head close to the ground, but there was absolutely no way that any human could move so quickly on all fours. It was too big to be a dog. There's no wildlife in the area, and if this thing was standing on two legs, it would have been at least six foot five, maybe seven feet tall. It didn't run like an animal, and it used its arms and legs independently of one and another. It darted under a street light, and it was all black. Not dressed in black clothing, or covered in black fur but it seemed to be the kind of black that indicates an absence of all color and eliminates depth, more like a shadow. Just as quick as it showed up, it was gone. It had scurried down an embankment near some other houses. I finally realized that the light was green and I needed to get home, so I ran back to my house. I don't like walking in that area anymore, and even driving through it at night still gives me the chills. To this day, I have no idea what I saw. I know that it was something that I was not supposed to see. I'm glad that it didn't notice me noticing it. I find that most paranormal activity can be explained with science and logic. What I've become more open about, however, is certain feelings that can't be explained. The feeling that someone is watching you when you're alone. The feeling of a person sort of half being on your shoulder when there's no one around. My tattoo studio was built over a hundred years ago. It was a bank originally. The original safe is in the basement. We have turned into a room where we draw, eat, nap, whatever. It's been bars, a bakery, and several tattoo shops before us. So, the feelings. I feel myself being touched. I feel like I'm being watched. Being alone at the shop is miserable for me. I feel sick, physically, and anxious. I've been here nearly a decade. When you work somewhere long enough, you become accustomed to the quirks of a building. The sound the upstairs bathroom makes when the faucet is turned on, the difference in sound between the front and back door opening and closing, where a person would be in the shop by the sound of their footsteps. Occasionally, I will hear the distinct sound of footsteps when I'm alone in the shop. I've heard a person cough as if to get my attention, though I didn't hear anyone come in. I rushed up the stairs to apologize only to find there was no one there. I've had people, both those who claim to be empaths or sensitives or psychics, and those who don't even believe in ghosts mention they feel similarly. A lady once told me as she was getting tattooed, there's a man behind me, I feel him, and he's angry. I got freaked out and asked her not to talk about it. She got to leave and go home, but I'm stuck here. I'd almost rather not know. So here are my more recent experiences, both of which occurred on the same day last week. I had a late appointment and my coworkers had left. A client had brought their son with them for a short appointment. He was probably five or younger. The kid stood at the top of the stairs and peered into the basement. He says to his dad, Daddy... The basement is haunted. I was like, dude, get your sixth sense kid away from the stairs because he's freaking me out. As I'm leaving, I lock the front door. I turn off the lights and go to leave through the back door. Right as I'm walking out, the phone rang. I assumed it was my boss calling and asking why I was there so late, so I went to answer. 
Right as I place my finger over the answer button, the ringing stops and the phone read, line in use. I swear to God I felt my blood turn cold. The line in use means that someone had already answered the phone, but I was alone. The lights were off. I hit the end call button about a hundred times and tossed the phone away. It rang again six times, then went silent. I said forget this place and went to leave, then realized I left my keys in the basement. No thanks. I called my boss and told him what happened. He's not real hip on the ghost stuff, but it freaked him out too. I told him he needs to come get my keys from the basement for me or I was quitting, and in that moment I was completely serious. He drove from the next city over as I waited next to my car in the freezing rain so that I didn't have to be in the building. I don't know. I just felt it. I felt something was wrong. That was the first time I had ever had anything happen that was more than just a feeling or uneasiness or offhanded comment from a client. Someone once told me spirits can be attracted to places where blood has been spilt. I don't know if any of that is true. Maybe everything that's happened can be explained, but... I'm not going to be here alone ever again. I grew up in a smaller city outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Even though Pittsburgh is a well-known big city, the areas outside of Pittsburgh are often rural. My stepdad's house was an old farmhouse on one of these country roads. You should know that I am the youngest of my mom's four children, so by the time I was born, we didn't live with my stepdad anymore, and I grew up in the city area about 15 minutes away from my stepdad's house. Even though my mom and stepdad weren't together anymore, they were still very close, and we would always spend time at his house, especially during the summertime, because he had a huge in-ground pool that I loved to swim in. I don't really know much about the history of the house other than it was built in 1910, and like I said... I am the youngest of my siblings, so my two brothers and my sister actually lived in my stepdad's house for years before I was born. My sister is the oldest at 42, my oldest brother is 37, and my younger brother is 32, while I'm the youngest at 24. I was a surprise baby when my mom was 40 years old. Only reason I explain all this is because my siblings lived there for years and have many of their own paranormal stories that they used to tell me about this house. Most of the stories were of feelings that someone was watching you, or that they thought that they would see shadows in the dark. Nothing really that spooky or original that couldn't be explained as my siblings just trying to mess with me. My mom even had mentioned some similar stories where she felt like that there was something bad in this house, but nothing that I can remember in great detail. I think it's important to explain the layout of the house because the location inside is a key factor in whatever was haunting us in this house, at least it seems like it to me. There were two doors to get into the house, one on the front with a big porch that we didn't really use because it was directly off the road and we had a long driveway that led up to the other door that was on the back of the house. So when you enter from the back door, you would walk into the kitchen first, then would lead you past the basement door on the left and into what we called the front room. The front room is where my experience took place. It was just a big space that I guess could have been used as a dining space or something like that and on the other side of the front room was the actual living room with all the couches, TV and fireplace. But on the left side of the front room there was a small closet under this spiral staircase that would lead you to one of the bedrooms upstairs. If you kept walking straight from the front door you'd get to the bathroom and that was the end of that house from that direction. If you walked into the living room on the right you would get to where the front door was. If you walked into the front door, you were looking directly at the regular stairs to get to the second floor, not the spiral stairs I explained before, and on the left at the bottom of the stairs is the master bedroom that my mom and stepdad slept in. There were three bedrooms upstairs and each room had different colored carpets, so we always just referred to each room by the color. At the top of the stairs, there were two of the bedrooms directly to your left and right. On the left is what we called the green room and to the right was the blue room. From the blue room was the door to get to the last bedroom that we called the pink room. So you had to either walk through the blue room to get to the pink room or you could go up the spiral stairs from the front room to get there. The pink room was my sister's room when she was younger and all of her paranormal stories involved the pink room. Not only did that room creep all of us out, 
But I think every single one of us had fallen down those spiral stairs at some point, if not more than once. They were kind of dangerous because the steps were pretty steep, but weren't long enough to fit your entire foot onto them, even as a little kid. I remember vividly when I fell down those stairs. I had been hanging out in the pink room watching Barney when I decided to go downstairs. I was only maybe three or four years old at the time, but I don't remember tripping on anything or missing one of the stairs. I just fell, very hard all the way down the stairs as soon as I started walking, almost as if someone pushed me. No one really thought anything of it, though, because we were kids and what kid hadn't fallen down the stairs at some point? Anyways, now that you have a little background and understanding of where in the house I'm talking about, I can finally explain my paranormal experience. I think I was maybe four or five at the time, and this happened probably around 1999 or 2000. I was getting over some kind of cold, and I was still coughing a little bit, but otherwise I wasn't very sick. But at night, the coughing would get worse and it would keep me up. At the time, I slept in the middle of my mom and stepdad in the master room. I kept waking up coughing and asked my mom to give me a drink of water on the nightstand since I was in the middle and couldn't reach it. After waking my mom up a bunch of times, she eventually got annoyed and told me to get up and get some water from the kitchen. Not wanting to get in trouble again, I got up and went to the kitchen. I think it was probably around 2 or 3 in the morning and no one else was awake in the house. I drank the water, standing in front of the refrigerator, and left the glass in the kitchen when I was done. As I started to walk through the front room to go back to the master bedroom, I heard something that stopped me in my tracks. The front room and the living room didn't have any walls dividing the rooms, but we had one of the couches there that kind of separated the room. The sound was coming from the little closet under the spiral stairs. There was some kind of stick propped up against the door to the closet, maybe a broom handle with the broom screwed off. I was stopped with my back against the couch, so I was facing the closet, but was closer to the living room as far away as I could be from the closet. I heard a man's voice and not a voice of anyone I knew or know to this day. It definitely wasn't my stepdad's voice. It sounds pretty cheesy now, but the voice asked, Who is in my house? Very loud and angry. There weren't any TVs on, and no one else seemed to have heard it but me. As scary as the voice was, it wasn't as scary when the closet door started shaking like it was going to open up and the stick fell down. At this point, I was scared out of my mind and booked it back into the master bedroom with my mom and stepdad who were still fast asleep in bed. The next morning, I told everyone what happened and the stick was still laying on the ground like I remember it from the night before. Naturally, everyone thought that I was just making it up and probably knocked the stick over by myself or just dreamed the whole thing, but they still looked in the closet anyways to try and make me feel better. Of course, there was nothing there but I feel like the fact that the stick was on the ground in the morning and not propped up like it was before was proof enough for me that it really happened. I never really had any other experiences like that after that night, but I always felt like someone was watching me in that house. That is, until my stepdad died in 2006. My stepdad was a Vietnam veteran and had definitely seen some stuff in his day. He was always a good person, but was someone you never wanted to mess with. He wasn't scared of anyone. He passed away of lung cancer, but after he passed, it was like the evil force that was always in that house just went away. Shortly after my oldest brother got to keep the house and still lives there to this day, he never talks about any strange occurrences. My theory is that whatever was in that house was forced to leave whenever my stepdad passed, but I always wondered who that man was that spoke to me that night. I moved into my flat about a year ago and weird things have been happening that really are messing with my head. Small things at first that I just brushed off, but lately ramping up to bigger, more frequent things that I just can't explain. If anyone has any ideas, I'd really appreciate it as currently I'm left with either my flat is haunted or I'm having a psychotic break. So, I live in a town that is a bit of a mecca for alternative people seeking spiritual experiences and the town itself is very old and thought to be of great spiritual significance. The big hill I live on, however, was one of the last places to be inhabited, and before my building was built in the 80s, there was apparently nothing on this spot. I have been told that there had been a bit of 
difficulty keeping tenants here with a huge turnover in recent years, but mainly because of an unpleasant character who lived in one flat for a long time and caused a lot of bad feeling. Just to set the scene, as I'm pretty sure nobody died here, nothing truly horrific happened as far as I know, and there's no long history to the particular building, so why something or somebody would be attracted to haunt my place, I do not know. So small things at first. In the first six months or so, I kept finding the hot tap running in the bathroom sink, usually when either my ex or my mum were staying over. Usually I blame them as different house, different taps than they're used to, and there was never anybody in the bathroom to see the taps being turned on, so easy, solution. they just forgotten to turn them off fully. My mom is particularly creeped out by this as she swore it wasn't her and often jokes that I'm a magnet for creepy things, as so much weird stuff happened in her house when I lived there as a kid, and still today the lounge door has an eerie habit of swinging slowly shut when I'm over. It was maybe two months ago that something really freaky happened that scared the bejesus out of me. My bedroom is at the front left of the building with the bed head along the left-hand external wall a big bedside cabinet to each side. So basically, as I lie in bed, on the left side, the bedside cabinet on my far right is on the external detached corner of the building. It was maybe 2 a.m. as I'm rubbish at sleeping when I heard a scuffling that sounded like someone rummaging through paper from that corner. At first I ignored it, probably badgers outside, I don't know, chewing on the building. Do badgers even do this? or my upstairs neighbor doing something that threw the noise in a weird way so it sounded like it was downstairs. But no, it happened again, and it was definitely in the room. I freaked out quite a lot and scrambled for my bedside lamp and turned it on just to have it immediately turn itself off again. At this point, I honestly thought this is how I die. I've seen too many horror movies, and although it might not be the most dramatic thing to happen, living alone and hearing something in the room with you at night and the dark is absolutely terrifying. I can't explain how the light turned itself off as it has a switch that's either on or off, can't be balanced between the two settings so it can't flick itself off if it's half on, if you know what I mean. After switching it back on, no sleep was had that night. All was quiet for a week or so. Next, I went away for a weekend. When I got back, I found my alarm clock on the floor about a foot away from the edge of my bed. I'm really house proud and probably would be a massive pain to live with, but as I live alone, can keep everything in its spot to my tidy little heart's content. There is no way I would leave something lying on the floor like that. It's one of those mental old-fashioned ones with bells on top, and I know from past experiences that it makes a lot of racket if you drop it on wood floor, so I can't have knocked it off without noticing. The back was off, and the batteries were lying across the floor. So, weird, but... Not too terrifying. I managed to pretend that didn't happen either so I wouldn't be too scared to sleep in my own home. Then over the next two weeks things kept happening. A couple of more with the clocks too. First the time kept changing. Not consistently running slow but like it was being set to a new time and then running happily from there. New batteries. Nobody had touched it. And it hadn't happened before these recent occurrences. Then, for the first time, the bathroom hot tap turned itself on while I was in the room. Actually, in the bath, to be specific. One minute, not on, next minute, out of nowhere, blasting hot water. Then I found something else on the same bedside cabinet, with the back off and batteries out. I have a makeup mirror surrounded by lights as I do my makeup when I get out of the shower and don't want to terrify my neighbors by opening the curtains. I don't move it, let alone knock it in any way that would jolt the back off. Then this week, another pointless clock thing. I always time my wake up and journey to work exactly so I don't get in early because I'm actually pretty lazy. I have a five minute walk, get there on the dot and sign in every time at exactly X time. This time I get there and my assistant manager points to the clock and makes an ooh, you're early special occasion type remark. And I was, ten minutes early exactly 10 minutes. When I had left home, 5 minutes in the future. I told him his clock was wrong. can't remember what he replied, but I do remember saying to him, yeah right, because all my clocks are wrong. I was so certain that, you know, 
Oakham's razor and all that, his clock had to be wrong because it would be too stupid for every clock in my flat to be at the exact same wrong time, including my phone. But as I discovered when I got home that night, they all were. I had to google the time as literally every clock of mine showed the same time. I didn't actually realize you could still manually adjust the time on smartphones. I'm of the generation when we had to set up all that stuff with every new phone we got in the late 90s, early 2000s, but since smartphones, I have literally done nothing to set up phones apart from transfer all my stuff onto my new handset and one go and bingo, phone set up. I have just never had to look for that setting, but when I did, 10 minutes fast. As was my battery-powered alarm clock, as was my microwave. These things are so small and utterly pointless individually, but taken together, it's just weird. I am easily spooked as a general rule, and I have to not creep myself out, or I'll never be able to sleep there again. But it's so odd. Helpful colleagues have suggested I try to talk to whatever it might be, but honestly, I'd rather call a priest or burn it down. I'm not communicating with anything that might be there. I've also been advised not to burn sage and try to eject it as it might make it angry, which I really do not want to do either. Any thoughts? I have a carbon monoxide alarm, so hopefully it's not that. Also, hopefully I'm not finally cracking up mentally. I don't have rats or mice either to explain the weird scuffly noise in the bedroom. I had mice in a previous rented place, and there are no signs here. Is all this too insignificant and easily explainable? I just don't know what is happening. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Link's in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.